the thing that matters most in life, I think, is love. When we look back at our lives, it's the people that we've loved and love us that matter to us most, and that love is strong medicine. But love is not a soft skill. Love is difficult. I'm delighted to introduce as my guest today, my friend, the powerhouse Julia Samuel, the UK's leading psychotherapist specialising in bereavement and grief. She's the author of three best-selling books, and her Monday Top Tips provides a weekly ballast for many on Insta Live. Now she's the host of a new podcast series, Therapy Works, which has provided me, personally, with a lesson on how to listen better. I can't wait to listen and talk with her at Orion's Chelsea. Julia, it's so wonderful to see you here. You've been a, a huge influence in my life, I have to say, for many years, both in what you've written and your great advice to me in our walks in Somerset. And I'm thrilled that you've made it here to Orient to talk to me. In fact, you are the spring chicken of the third act. You don't really qualify because you're only 62 and really to qualify you should be 65. But I wanted you to come on because although your career has spanned 30 years and you've got a, your reputation as, as the foremost psychotherapist in the country, grief psychotherapist, I think they call you the grief czar, don't they? The, lately, I think since maybe just before lockdown, you've started a whole new aspect to your career in um, book writing and social media. Tell me why you decided to start writing at this late stage in your life. Well, thank you for inviting me, and I'm very glad to be the spring chicken. <laughs> so I wrote my first book, actually, in 2017. I never really wanted to write a book. I didn't think I had anything to say, but an agent came to see me and said, of course, everyone must have been asking you to write a book. And I said, actually, no one has ever asked me to write a book. And she's Felicity Rubinstein, and she was very... She was so clever because she wasn't persuasive. She said, listen, mm. do a proposal and, you know, if you get decent offers, then it's worth writing a book. And if you don't, then that's fine. And I left it for about six months. And then literally I woke up one morning and I thought, I am mad. I have got to give this a go because I'll look back on my life and think, why on earth didn't I seize an opportunity that could be really interesting to do? So I did a proposal and it was about grief and the book is Grief Works, which turned out to be very successful. And I think if I was looking back and advising myself now to my decision then, it's because, you know, the 30 years of being in front of clients in the NHS and in my counselling room, I have accumulated a huge amount of knowledge about loss because that's all I saw. So it's thousands and thousands of hours. And what was amazing about writing was that I remembered the stories and the emotions and the processes. And I think what's powerful about the book is that what's most personal is most universal. So people could see themselves in the different stories. And I find out I loved writing. I mean, I left school at 16. You know, I was of the generation where my twin brother, my dad wanted him to be educated and I was just intended to be married. Yes, the systemic <laughs> patriarchy of the of the times. But actually, Julia, you are a marvellous writer. It's not just that one can see oneself in every different story. It's more that I was really fascinated in the process of you as a therapist because you put yourself in the story and you see yourself, as I read it, I can see you responding or trying to respond to your client. And I was really interested in the development of you going off in your cycle afterwards and trying to calm yourself down when you get over-emotional about how involved you are with one of your stories. And I wonder whether the writing of it clarified for you the whole process of being a therapist. So, I mean... I recorded every session with my clients that I use in the book. And, you know, normally that's just compressed and you write brief notes and you have supervision. So taking those out and really thinking about them and finding a narrative for them 
meant that I had to examine my own responses more deeply. I recognized where I'd missed things, where I got things wrong, where I'd made assumptions, where I was ignorant. And of course, I learned a lot. You know, like Virginia Woolf said, she only knows herself when she writes. And I Mm. think there is a truth in that and that journaling is an incredibly therapeutic, powerful way of finding out what they really think and feel. So that was definitely true for me. But I I think in the writing process, I'm not so aware of how it's read or how it's perceived, but I am aware of the relationship of me with my client mm. and that's what I'm trying to put on the page. So yes. they very much live in me and they stay yeah. with me for days when I'm writing them. And, I, you know, I liken writing a book to having a very complicated relationship, you know, an affair where sometimes the boyfriend or a girlfriend replies to your texts and loves you and you absolutely get your needs met. And sometimes they basically effing ghost you Mm. and there's nothing, there's no words on the page and, you know, the book is not delivering what you want it to. And so it's very intense. Often my husband is saying, what are you thinking about? And I'm always thinking Thinking about about my boyfriend, (laughs) which is is my book and you wake up thinking about it you go to sleep thinking about it so it's very for me it's very obsessive you say in almost the first breath that every family has a story except your own family (laughs) where the story or the narrative that people told themselves was suppressed it was a frozen family in a sense that was your family's coping mechanism I'm one of five so this is my experience and that you know like I say very clearly in the book every member of a family of sibling members have a different perception of their experience of childhood. So my four other siblings may have a completely different perception that I do. But my experience, and this is really looking back now that I'm 62, now I look at it and sort of examine it. My mother had incredibly significant bereavements by the time she was 25. So her mother, her father, her sister and her brother had all died suddenly and unexpectedly. And my father, his father and his brother had died suddenly and unexpectedly. So they were of the generation who were brought up by veterans of the First World War who'd all kind of been very brave but, you know, had to kind of survive and procreate and get on. And my parents were very much of that same mentality is that what you don't talk about isn't going to hurt you Mm. and forget and move on. And that, you know, I really have compassion for that because that is all they knew. And it basically was all that was available. Mm. But I was brought up with these black and white photographs of my aunts and uncles and my grandparents, and I knew nothing about them. I didn't know how they died. I didn't know what their characters were like. And so there was absolute silence about this massive, significant, multiple losses that both my parents had experienced. And I think how that influenced me was that we were also given great skills. So one of our family norms was to put on a good show so Mm -hmm. that we could always talk with people and kind of pull yourself together to be with other people. And actually, I think that's very useful. But I also knew that what I was seeing wasn't matching everything that I was experiencing and that there was a lot of silence and I would be examining. So I didn't speak that much being the youngest, I observed. And I think that observation, always trying to work out what was going on inside rather than what people were saying, is what shaped me to be a therapist. It's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes as the youngest child, you can be clamouring for the attention, look at me and I'm here and I'm the littlest and so you wanted to be noticed. But the conversely, you you became the listener and the observer. That is true. And also, if you're a therapist, you are very important to your clients. Mm. I create, I hope, a relationship that facilitates them responding to the devastation or the loss or the suffering that they have. Mm. But I become very important to them because I am then their connection to them finding a way of living Mm. with the pain that they're living with and finding a way of living and loving again. Mm. And so you could certainly argue that although it was hidden in an NHS room for 25 years, I actually found a very good way of getting connection and attention. 
You certainly did. Did you ever find a way to connect to them in, later in life as you grew up and realised that there there had been these skeletons in the cupboard? Did you ever quiz them about it and did they ever open up in older age? So I did. I asked both my mum and dad. And my mother, when she talked particularly about her brother Tony, who was killed in Arnhem, who was killed in the war, she told me the story of being in a cookery school in Edinburgh where she was when she was called out of the room and told that he'd been killed. And she went back into the lesson and finished her lesson and went to a movie in the evening and never talked about it. But when she spoke about it, she was as raw and as distressed as that 17-year-old girl. So it was completely unprocessed loss. And she couldn't really talk more. She talked a little bit about her sister dying, but not very much. And I could never really get anything out of my dad. Mm. I asked my mum tons of questions in the sort of 10 years before she died. And she just would answer what she wanted to say. So I never, I never really got under her skin. My parents were very loving and I feel very grateful to them. And I actually have a lot more understanding of them and compassion for them now having written the book. But they weren't very interested in me being a therapist. And I don't think, often I think they didn't really know what I did. And <laughs> when, she was, when she was dying, she'd just come back from the, the GP with my sister Sabrina and had been told that she had, a, you know, six months to live. And I said to her, Mum, you know, I heard you had a, a difficult time with the doctor. What did he, he tell you? And she said, oh, darling, I've got flu. And she completely changed her diagnosis in her mind. And she'd used, used denial her entire life. But she had chosen her coffin. She'd marked it with a big fat pen what coffin she wanted. She'd organised her funeral. So she knew that she was dying and her coping mechanism was not to talk about it. And that I had, I definitely respected. And it worked for her. I suppose it worked for a huge generation of people, didn't it? And, you know, my husband certainly won't even discuss getting older and what happens in the next act. And and my own father said to my son the other day when he was talking about being stressed because he broke up with his girlfriend, well, don't misuse the word stress. I thought, well, it is pretty stressful. So there's that that stiff upper lip thing of the older generation and how we are now, which is much more prone to navel gazing, much more questioning and, and wanting to go into our inner psyches. Is one better than the other? Is there any time when when not confronting the pain can be valuable, the soldiering on? On the one hand, I think the confusion about the stiff upper lip is that if you shut down on all of your feelings to everybody, you know, pain is the agent of change of whatever it is that you're facing that's difficult and you, you, you don't want to feel. And when we block the pain, we block our capacity to feel change, but also our capacity to adjust to this new reality. And the things that we do to block the pain, if we do it all of the time is the thing in the end that does us harm over time. But we need to be able to move into and move out of our emotions so that you have a break from it. And I think the stiff upper lip is absolutely vital to be able to go to work, to go to Sainsbury's and have a coping mechanism, have a regulatory kind of managing system that allows you to live in the world however much, how, whatever you're going through. I think the error is if you take that stiff upper lip into your private, personal, intimate relationships, because then you are very isolated. Mm -hmm. And actually the thing that matters most when we're suffering, whether it's from grief from a death or grief from a living loss, like breaking up or losing mm -hmm. your job, is the love and connection to others. Mm -hmm. And the process of having feelings is that emotions are there to give us information to run through our body, come out of our body, release us. And in that moment of release, we incrementally adjust this new reality that we didn't want and we didn't choose. And what about the, the argument that you're opening in Pandora's box? And if you open that lid a little bit, everything, everything that you've kept nicely flattened down, ironed down will come like in a, like the genie out of a bottle and it will be hard to put it back in. I think that there's truth in that, 
in that, you know, if you're 87, or in my case, 90, like my mum when she was dying, now is not the time to open that genie because this is the coping mechanism you've developed for decades and it keeps you safe Mm. and it gives you a sense of agency Mm. and control at a time in your life when you're extremely vulnerable. Mm. So I don't think that is the time. I do think one of the kind of certainties of life, one is that we're going to die and the other is that life is change and Mm. that those that thrive and sort of look back at their lives with satisfaction are those that have had the capacity to love most and to adjust through their lives. Because life always brings change through Mm. ageing, through phases and through events. You know, I mean, the world has seen it with the pandemic, but that in a way is a a kind of wake up for what has always been true, that fundamentally we don't have control over the things that matter to us most, which is whether we live or die. I mean, we influence it and also whether people love us or not. But do you think the pandemic allowed us, because we've never been very good in the West at talking about dying or talking about ageing even, I think it's swept under the carpet. Do you think that the last two years people have, have... confronted their mortality more easily and it's it's a uh, conversation that we are prepared to have so i think you know when people haven't talked about death and dying it's because there's a kind of magical thinking which is if i think or talk about this that is in some way going to make it happen it's going to hasten my death mm. so if i close my eyes and it pretend it happens to other people that will keep me alive and i think the pandemic did mean that more people had those conversations around their kitchen table. They talked about, you know, whether they wanted to be on a life support machine, what would happen, what their fears were. But I think as we come out of the pandemic, we are reverting back to not talking about it and closing our eyes. Mm. So I was in Japan recently and it was cherry Blossom Festival. And what really fascinated me was that everyone, all the care homes, took the old people out onto the street in their in their wheelchairs. And they the old people were included in the in the village celebration in such a marvelous way with the younger children going up to the older people to talk to them and interact. And that really warmed me. I thought, why in our world do we Instead of listening to, instead of allowing people to have their wrinkles, number one, and instead of acknowledging and recognizing and admiring people for their wisdom and experience, we sh- shovel them aside. We we don't allow people to stay in their jobs beyond the age of fifty five, even. Why? Well, I think there's a there's a pull and push. So, in the case studies in my book, a lot of the grandparents were incredibly powerful matriarchs in their families and they held enormous influence. And so I think there can be very powerful role models that we have of grandparents who are incredibly important Mm. to the stability of family because Mm. they can can ease massive tensions and mend fences and create space for families to operate and live in that I don't think we've kind of fully acknowledge, although it really happens on a day-to-day basis. You know, I think something, I can't remember the number, but it's something like a third of all childcare is with grandparents. I might have got that wrong, but it's a big number anyway. On the other hand, there's this tension about making space for young people to have careers and that as our population is growing and our older people are are multiplying, that we need to kind of, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, I need to step out so that young people can come up. And then there is the bias, which is that when you're older, you are stupid or inadequate or uh, fragile or weak, um, and you don't have the energy anymore. And so all of that creates... Yeah, that's a lot of competing views. And in some ways, what's important about the conversations you're having is for all of us to recognise our own biases and to recognise that there is a lot that we can gain and learn from and, you know, help us in many jobs 
from people who are who are older and that we can't make assumptions about anybody because of their age. No. I think what would also be important is for there to be more forums where young people and older people communicate. So, the, yeah. you know, one of the big difficulties from lockdown, but from decades before lockdown, is isolation and loneliness. And one in seven people in this country would describe themselves as lonely. Loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 11 cigarettes a day. And young people are lonely. So I think there's this idea of old widows who are 85 who are lonely living in their bedsits or care homes. But actually, there is a big um, group of young people who who describe themselves as lonely. And there must be some bridge between that. And I think we're missing out on connection in communities. Like in, in Froome, there's this thing called where we both... Uh, live near there's this thing called compassionate, compassionate. communities it's brilliant that led by dr julian abel yes. and there's this network of connectors of putting people in touch with mm. younger and old, older people there's men's sheds there's running groups there's all sorts of different communities and i think that's where we need to think invest about it in more. yes yeah. exactly one of the things that has has emerged in my conversations with people during these podcasts is the sense of not even incipient ageism, but pretty blatant ageism, especially for women after a certain age where they get sidelined and dismissed. And I think perhaps the pandemic didn't improve this because we were encouraged to see anyone over the age of 50 as fragile and in need of protection. So maybe there is a, a more of a chasm between ages than there was before. Are we profoundly ageist in our society? I, I mean, I think there are two voices that are kind of coming out at the moment. There's the all of the voices about, you know, the thing you see with age is anti-age, mm. anti-wrinkle cream. Don't grow old, mm. you know, use all these serums mm. or mm. take this juice or mm. run this marathon and you're going to remain young. Yum. And I think what most people would do a very happy deal with is that they want to age because it's better than the alternative, which is death. <laughs> but they want to fulfill their potential and live healthily. And so people talk about health span as well as lifespan mm. because of our society's aging so much more. And I think some of the negative energy about aging is the burden of baby boomers like me. So I'm the kind of young end of baby boomers who mm. go up to sort of 80, mm. the burden of them on those who are kind of middle ages, gen generation X, and the cost of them and that they're living so long, but often living with three or four different serious medical conditions, which mm. of course is an enormous burden mm. on our health service. So I think the positive side of it is that we see people like the people on your podcast who are giving us role models and ways of living and being and working and being productive and successful and having agency and being sexy and beautiful in their third chapter of life. And I don't think that even existed in my mother's time. But a lot of it is about fear. Mm. I mean, I remember, I mean, this is probably a bit too vain, but I do remember walking down the street with my three daughters as they were kind of teenagers and recognising, not enjoyably, that I completely was invisible, that I did not exist, and that builders didn't wish me yes. <laughs> about yes. my day anymore. <laughs> they didn't wish me, you know, have yes. a good day or how are you, love? They literally didn't care. Yes. And I was never one of those people that minded being shouted at. I always quite liked it. I quite it. liked it too, yes. <laughs> and then recognising that I am completely invisible was a, a bit of a wake-up call. But I am grateful, the thing I'm grateful for is that I always worked. Mm. I mean, I've worked my entire life. I've never, ever not had a job. Mm. And when I, particularly when we're talking about women getting older, what I would say to young people now who are having children and the nightmare juggle of trying to be a good enough mother and keep their job going is as much as you can keep your foot in the door. Because if you stop work completely, going back to work 20 years later, as in one of the case studies in um, Every Family Has a Story, 
is a much more difficult negotiation. You're in your 60s now. What are the benefits of ageing for you? Do you feel happier than you were in middle age, well, in your 40s or in your youth? I'm really happy now. I feel like I'm in the prime of my life now. I have the same energy I feel as fit and strong. So I feel very, very lucky. And there is that whole research about the U-bend that people in their 40s, I think it's to their 50s, you know, when they're squeezed between teenage children and ageing parents and having to work, that they have the lowest well-being stats. But that as you age, before you get ill, as it were, you know, which is about mid-70s, that is a really kind of prime time of life. And so I am really happy. But I do a lot of stuff to keep me well and healthy. So I, I read a lot of things about lifestyle. So, you know, your genetics are only 20% of your likelihood of dying at a particular age. 80% of it is your lifestyle choices. And I... You're very healthy. You're I do fit. all the damn things yeah. that keep me... It's mainly my... I really don't want my brain to go. So I, I want to stay curious and learning and expanding and having fun. I really want to have fun. You're an exemplary in that. I know you make time have fun and you're incredibly busy as well so you also schedule in um, exercise and also you as you say you're learning things so the last three years you've taught yourself how to be an instagrammer and you do insta lives and you do pod you're now you're going about to be a podcast around you this is all completely new territory for you isn't it three years ago you didn't even have an instagram account Two and a half years ago, I didn't have an Instagram. I've I've had two series of podcasts before. But no, it, all of it is new to me. But the thing that I just instinctively did in lockdown was I kept on getting all these messages from organisations and charities and individuals saying, I don't know what to do. I feel so anxious. I'm worried about my teenage children. I'm worried about my parents. Um, I'm worried about my health. I'm worried about dying. And so I just started giving out little small films and then I started doing little interviews with people who could give information or interviews with people who were bereaved so that other people could kind of, so it would normalize it that and that's what I want to go on doing I want to be going on having conversations with people from different worlds mm. from different types of living who are having their experiences and I want to learn from them. And with that, I want the people who follow me to learn from them too. If your 20-year-old self could see you now, what do you think your 20-year-old self would be thinking and saying? I think she'd be absolutely gobsmacked. Because, I mean, I had no expectations of working, definitely not of writing. My 20-year-old self knew literally nothing and thought about almost nothing except having fun. So, and that was all I was interested in, was going out, meeting people and having a lot of fun. I loved dancing. And so I was interested in doing that. And I flirted a lot. And the last thing in the world I would have expected would be that I would be an expert on death and dying and grief. I mean, I would have wanted it to be on sex and love, <laughs> but no, that isn't what happened. So, I mean, I'd have been absolutely very shocked. I mean, the, the thing that matters most in life, I think, is love. When we look back at our lives, it's the people that we've loved and love us that matter to us most and that love is strong medicine. But love is not a soft skill. Love is difficult, and it requires endurance and courage and commitment and money, and, you know, it's messy and chaotic. So I think if we can f find ways of daring to love and connect with each other, both as neighbours, in families, in partnership, you know, with our communities... That is what matters most. Is it possible to overlove, to smother as a mother? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and be codependent yes. and be a nightmare. I yeah. mean, I know I drive my children nuts. I mean, we basically have a very good relationship, but I also annoy them. And they tell me I exude. Um, I say <laughs> that like it's not true. And I know I do exude. So, you know, love, as I said, is difficult. And it's knowing 
when to move in. It's knowing when to step back. It's knowing when to let go. It's when knowing when to hold on. And all of that is different at different phases of your life in that, you know, as I age, I will naturally let go, but I will need them to move towards me, I hope, and support me, which they may not want to do. And now it is my job, I think, to negotiate a really difficult pathway between being, you know, my eldest daughter's 41 and I still tell her to put a coat on because it's cold outside. And she's like, <laughs> mum! <laughs> And, but other times I think I do kind of let her be a grown up and she, I definitely do as she tells me. But my job is to negotiate being in the background and supportive when they need us. So not kind of abandoning them, but also trusting them to be fully adult and in their life and in their world. And that's such a hard decision to make. It's how you love and, you know, the, the underpinning emotion is love and that there's the goodwill and the intention that what you're doing and when you mess up is for your good but also there's the capacity for repair after rupture so the thing I talk about a lot in in the book is a that everybody has a different experience of family there isn't one right way and kind of recognizing that but also you know where you love most you will fight most and you will hurt most and you'll make your deepest mistakes I mean I have definitely hurt and been hurt most within my family than anywhere else. Mm. And learning to connect and repair and heal after a, a rupture is key to creating families that survive all sorts of difficulties and, and are resilient. It's, mm. it's never about not having the fight. You are always going to have fights in families. And finally, Julia, your life score, what satisfaction, what is your... On, on from one to ten. Oh my god but that's like a number where you either sound unbelievably <laughs> smug <laughs> which I don't want to do I think or, I'd put you a nine and a half I am really happy mm. but also I I know that bad things are going to happen they've happened so I'm not I'm like this particular moment today nine. right now is nine and a half okay. and I'm extremely grateful and I'm going to kind of Hold on to it so it can help me when I go back down to oh, a two. Two, exactly, because it's never always going to stay at a nine and a half, is it? No. And and do you have any sense of there being an afterlife, or do you believe in an afterlife, or is it really about the here and now? I I'm kind of spiritual. I mean, obviously, through all my working years, I've had so many different beliefs and the importance of it. I personally think that when I die, the only way I live on is in the memory and the love of others that I've connected to. I am open. And maybe I'll get more spiritual as I'm near death. It would be nice to believe there's something else, but I actually think we invent it because we're frightened of death, truth be told. And on that note, <laughs> I want to thank you so much for talking to me. It's a thank pleasure, you. Catherine. Thank you. If you've enjoyed today's show, you can hear more episodes in the series by clicking follow wherever you're listening to this or simply searching The Third Act on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. And if you think your friends would love to listen, please do tell them about us. This episode was produced by Pete Norton and made possible by Orens, luxurious residences that are redefining later living in the heart of Chelsea. I'm Catherine Fairweather. And I can't wait to join you next week for the third act. <laughs>